Welcome sentient beings from all known universes and beyond. It's time to activate your cranial downlinks and prepare to receive a raft of discussion on a cosmic ocean of science fiction and fantasy topics, interviews with local area genre devotees, and insightful prognostication by our soothsayers of science fiction, our forecasters of fantasy, and any other beings that happen to get caught in our gravity well. This is the Galactic Driftwood Podcast. Hello, and welcome to this episode of the Galactic Driftwood Podcast. I'm Bill. And I'm Linda. I'm Charles. I'm Jenna. And I'm Chris. And on today's show, we're going to be talking about uh, a uh, movie that came out not too long ago, uh, definitely this year, um, called Asteroid City, um, which sounds like it's <laughs> maybe got some sci-fi to it maybe and maybe it does but mostly no i don't know <laughs> what's that jenna From the trailer there was going to be sci-fi yes right yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Chris, you want to go, go so ahead and walk us through what this is? yeah so I'll, I'll give the plot summary here uh off a website and, and really it it's kind of a a play within a play story within a story if you will so there are three different storylines in Asteroid City, okay? First, there's a Brian Cranston, a 1950-esque TV host who introduces audiences to a live, televised production of the play within the movie, Asteroid City, okay? There's a play within the movie, Asteroid yeah. City. Second, there is a behind-the-scenes story of how the play came to be. Uh, this includes the playwright Conrad Earp, He's played by Edward Norton. He's got a kind of a weird um, accent in this one. It's kind of strange. Uh, the play's director, Schubert Green, uh, played by uh, Adrian Brody, and the entire cast. The lead actor, who's Jones, uh, played by Jason Schwartzman, has a romantic affair with Conrad, the playwright. Um, so that's kind of the second part of it. Um, you're going to hear a lot of actors' names because this is a fully casted, full of stars. Very star-studded. Yeah. Um, yeah. Movie slash play slash film slash bunch of things. Uh, so Tom finally, Hanks, yeah, Tom Hanks, a bunch of bunch of actors. So finally, there's the play itself, which takes up the majority of the film. So this is what uh, you see on the screen the majority of the time, uh, the movie that you effectively thought you were coming to see based <laughs> off the, the trailers. Uh, so our protagonist is a guy named Augie Steenbeck, played by Schwartzman, who's a photographer who's taking his son Woodrow, um, played by Jake Ryan, to the Junior Stargazer Convention, uh, along with Woodrow's three young sisters. The convention is being held in a place called Asteroid City, which is a small town in the desert where an asteroid once famously crash landed, leaving a huge crater and a tiny space rock. But fortunately, the Steenbeck family, uh, their car breaks down upon arrival in the town. Uh, Augie calls his father-in-law, Stanley, who's played by Tom Hanks, uh, to come pick up the girls, and it's revealed that Augie's wife had recently died, and he hasn't yet told his kids. And by recently, yeah. I mean like three recently, weeks ago. Recently, yeah, it was in three weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> so Augie breaks the news to Woodrow and his children that their mother is dead, and the family is stuck sorting through their feelings of grief in this strange uh, town. So that that's kind of the plot summary, and there's a lot to unpack here i think between the three different you know scenes within the play within the movie yeah uh to, to, to kind of look at um bill you mentioned earlier you know one of the one of the the follow-up articles we were reading kind of trying to digest the film uh we we all watched it as a group uh last night was um it's a story about grief yeah, yeah. So, and go ahead, yeah go ahead. go ahead yeah so uh in the story, the, the lead um, character in there, Augie, um, he's playing a, a character, obviously, as Chris just said, who lost his wife and uh, kind of trying to come to terms with that. Um, and, however, in real life, he is the uh, partner of the guy who wrote the story. And we find out later on in the film that the guy who wrote the story 
uh, recently died as well. So the actor is trying to come to terms with his grief over the loss of his um, significant other lover or whatever. Um, but, uh, and he's also uh, dealing with that same sense of grief uh, in the play that he's acting in. And he's uh, seems like he's trying to use the, the act in the play as a way to come to terms with his grief in real life. And we actually see at the end where um, he kind of walks off the play towards the end. There's like a six minute break where other actors are doing things. And he goes and finds the, the director and he says, well, you know, am I doing this right? What, what's the point? You know, what's the point of this, this movie? Right. And the director basically says, don't worry about that. Just keep doing what you're doing. You're doing great. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I think essentially it, it, it goes to the point of, you know, there really is no point to grief. It, you just have to, you just have to deal with it and, and move through it, I think is what that's trying to say. And we actually see him after he talks to the director, he kind of goes out um, of the studio for a breath of fresh air where he runs into the actress that, would have been playing his wife in the play, but that whole segment uh, was cut from the play for time. Um, but he asks her uh, to kind of go through their scene because he wants to know what he's missing. What might he be missing from that, that part? And it was kind of interesting in that, you know, she's kind of going through both of their lines. She's reading both of their lines, telling him what they are. And, and uh, she says uh, the, the uh, the wife in the play tells him at one point you need to move on and go on with your life and, and continue living kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think that's kind of the message for the thing. And he actually, you know, during the course of the uh, the play uh, falls in love with one of the the actresses, which happens to be Scarlett Johansson's character. Midge. And um, yeah, and we see at the very end. Um, everyone's kind of left Asteroid City after this all rigmarole that we'll get into went on. And he gets a note. He goes into the, the town's diner with his kids for a, a meal there before they leave. And and the uh, the uh, waitress gives him a note from Scarlett Johansson's character that with her uh, P.O. box address so he can reach out to her indicating, you know, and then we see them leave town kind of indicating that, yeah, you know, life goes on it's time to move on to the next chapter kind of a thing so um any three uh, weeks after the wife's death though i'm gonna say she's a rebound but you know <laughs> yeah right i mean are you gonna say no to a girl no to never never <laughs> but, i mean his wife was portrayed by uh margot robbie um so i mean he was doing pretty well so i'd be pretty heartbroken about that but still right. Right. He, uh, he, you know, <laughs> the, the strange thing about him kind of moving on is it doesn't feel like it's moving on for him. So I feel like you don't, it takes the whole film for him to basically start processing his grief. Yeah. Right. And it, it doesn't really start to happen until he starts talking with, with Midge, despite everything else that's going on, um, in the film. Uh, there's a lot of different things going on and we'll talk about this scene and a bunch of other ones. So um, one of the ones I thought was interesting were all the kids that were there um, for the science convention convention yeah, and all the different inventions that they kind of had. <laughs> um, I'll have to pull up the, the list of all the ones they had, but one of them was like being able to incinerate matter or something like that. It was like this yeah. handheld matter disintegrator, matter disintegrator type device thing. The other uh, one was a jetpack, and yeah, jetpack. Um, uh, the kid, uh, Augie's son, uh, who was able to portray whatever images you wanted up on the moon. Uh, right. <laughs> so then they were, you know, so he puts an American flag up there, you know, very American. Uh, but right. he had a bunch of different images you could put onto the moon, and and there was a scene in there where you know, as people kind of look at these inventions, uh. That, that got me laughing, which is like, you're none of your guys' kids are ordinary, are they? Or like normal? And they're all just yeah. like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was pretty hilarious. Um, yeah, and 
just uh just watching all these event inventions demonstrated and then the the awards they give out there's the one of the jet pack linda's showing yep. now um uh yeah it was uh it was pretty hilarious and uh i like yeah I, like uh, I like how the string is just a, like wrapped around his ankle yeah, yeah. <laughs> that'll be good enough <laughs> right it'll be fine so uh Augie's son uh, is his name is Woodrow, and um, he's uh, he's got a shirt on it with his with the name Brainiac stitched over the pocket there um, <laughs> that uh, his mother did for him called him a Brainiac and he he liked that um, and uh, he he was pretty much a Brainiac but uh, the the part that I thought was the most hilarious was when the car broke down and they. They pulled into the, the gas station there in Asteroid City, right, as the car breaks down. And so the, the mechanic there hauls the car in, puts it up on the rack and looks at it. And he goes, well, you know, it's either one of two things. It's either like a simple 75 cent part and you'll be back on the road again. Or we'll have to junk the entire car. Yeah, the engine explodes, a drivetrain falls out, all yeah. this kind of stuff. Right. And but I think. It's an interesting little example going into the movie that you're going to face things that you'd never faced before. So how right. are you going to react to it? Right. Yeah. So that car in the background there, that's perfect timing, uh, yeah. is the one he points to when he says, uh, otherwise your car ends up like this. You yeah. Know, sold for sold scrap. For scrap. <laughs> yeah. So and, go ahead, Bill. And then, it, and then it actually turns out to be a third thing. So, <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of like a binary choice and, you know, it, the fact that it ends up being a third thing is kind of true to life, right? Very rarely yeah. is life a binary choice. There's always, you know, a spectrum of things that you run into. And uh, so the, the third thing is hilarious. I don't know what fell out of the car, but it's twisting and sparking and hopping around. And they have to, like, smother it with a fire extinguisher to mm -hmm. get it to stop. Yeah, and the part he puts in is just tiny little thing that honestly is not nothing. It's not a real car part or anything. No, uh, like like it's not something that that any you know machine mechanic or whatever would would recognize. So he screws this thing in. Very interesting, you know, cinematography there with the scene of him screwing this one little tiny part in. He goes in, starts the car, starts right up, seems to be fine, and he goes, "Well, you're in luck. It was the first one." And as he says, you know, you owe me like 10 bucks or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. Then the car starts doo -doo 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 and it kind of like self implodes. As Bill <laughs> mentioned, parts come flying out and sparking for no, it, it looked like an alternator, you know, if anything, yeah. um, it was very weird, but uh, yeah, it was. Uh, and the guy was like, you know, this is, you know, the third thing, it, you know, that we've never encountered before. <laughs> and yeah. He was like, of course it had to be. Yeah. Like of all the things. <laughs> Well, and as the car falls apart and the parts fall out of it, all four tires go flat. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> and, so. and let's go back to the fact that such a star studded cast. I mean, this bit part is done by Matt Dillon, who's an yeah. Oscar nominee, mm -hmm. who's been in many different films. He does a great job. He had he had like yeah. one part, play that mechanic mm -hmm. and, and sell it, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, Steve Carell's the, uh, the hotel owner in Asteroid <laughs> City. Motel owner, I guess, right? That yeah. back in process was hilarious. <laughs> and uh, he's got all these vending machines, one of which sells real estate. land, real yeah. estate. And yeah. so he's constantly trying to get people to buy tracts of land. And they're like, well, what about water? And he says, no water. This is a desert. <laughs> yeah. So that colorful wall behind him was all the uh, vending machines of different types. Um, so I, in the I beginning. agreed as a group that you needed the martini vending machine. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We need to get that on the veranda. Um, there's a scene where in the near the beginning where everybody starts to check in and one of the guests um, uh, comes to find out that their room had burned down. So Steve, uh, uh, I think it was Steve Carell was explaining, yeah. you know, hey, yeah, we went to put in a bunch of upgrades and put these components in and these other components and everything was looking all nice and then it burned down. So we got to a nice <laughs> tent with great amenities and you know, you'll yeah. be comfortable and quite sure. And the guy was like, uh, you know, the guy who was checking in was like, you know, I don't, I don't want to sleep in a tent. Like I wanted to. Uh, yeah. And he's like, yeah, you'll love it. You're just going to love it. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't, doesn't listen to his protestations at all. 
so the camera pans to the right and it's showing all these little rooms that everybody has. And then sure enough, there's the burned down room that the guy was supposed to have and the tent right next to it getting finished up. And it's pretty comical. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I, oh, ahead, I, I was going to say, I couldn't help feel a little bit of a racial tension with that only because the fact that this was the 1950s or just post-war and it happens to be the Japanese family yeah. who's yeah. Yeah. Um, little cabin has burned down. Right. Mm -hmm. So I doubt they'd burn it down on purpose, but obviously they did move them around to better accommodations. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And so, basically all these people are descending on this town for this giant for these big award this award ceremony for all these great inventions right and so they're all sitting there in the middle of the award ceremony uh around the crater of this asteroid that the town's named after or meteorite sorry even though it's called asteroid city um and uh what happens but uh uh an alien real quick oh, yeah. before that bill yeah there was one thing they had the clock, well, that they didn't realize was a clock that um, Woodrow pointed out to them was was a clock and was showing today's date. And that <laughs> right. comes up twice in the thing that they had been monitoring this yeah. signal or whatever, and they had no idea what it meant. And Woodrow was, takes like one look at it and was like, "Yeah, it's a, it's like a, it's, it's like a date. It's today's date." <laughs> So the scientist turns around and is like, oh, wait, what? Oh, it's today's date. And then it then it goes to the scene where we find out that it's the aliens, and the aliens had to uh, continue with that. But that was And Jeff Goldblum, uh, Jeff Goldblum pay, play, plays the alien, right? Of yeah, course. There's, uh, <laughs> there's, there's another theory out there. Um, it's, it's still the grief theory, but that this was a representation of COVID in oh. society. Interesting. Mm -hmm. and that we were all going through, um, yeah, oh, grief together, lost. yeah, or loss. That that sense of loss, which is why it's in, in, in towards the end where they have everybody go. You have to uh, in the uh, at the in the play go. You have to go to sleep before you can wake up. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it played to I think to the COVID uh, to a quarantine problem, right? Yeah, we could, we all we all feel like we went to sleep for a year or two. Yeah. Um, yeah, you can't wake up if you don't go to sleep. And then yeah. coincidentally, it just uh, what I saw just uh, the Steve Carell character was supposed to be Bill Murray. <laughs> except he caught COVID. Oh, really? Yeah. In real, in real life, yes. Huh. So they Bill swatted. Murray would have been funny in that role. Or Steve Carell yeah. did well. Yeah, Steve Carell did fine. It was just, it's an interesting, that's what it was cast for. I see. Yeah, there's well, the alien. And the meteorite. And I mean, the alien comes and steals the meteorite, <laughs> takes it, and the ship flies off. And then later he brings it back and drops it back after it's been inventoried. <laughs> That's yeah. funny. That was so funny. Well, the whole <laughs> scene of, of the alien coming down the first time they see it. So they're 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 all scheduled to look up at um was the moon for like some kind of eclipse. So they're all wearing the yeah. cardboard boxes and they're looking through the little filter there. Um, and then this green dot shows up and they're like, wait, that shouldn't be there. So they, you know, take their cardboard off and see that it's an alien ship. But when that alien comes down to take that meteor, meteor, um, you know, at one point, you know, it comes down slowly and it's all eyeballing everybody, right? Looking left, looking mm -hmm. right. And it's kind of like, I'm just gonna waltz in here and, uh, Yep, I'm just gonna pick this up, and uh, yep, I'm just gonna back up now and and get back on uh, my little mechanism here and uh, go back into space. And and uh, Augie goes to take a a photo, and it poses for a <laughs> second and, and like smiles there, like ah, and then it and then it leaves, and it's just like, what just happened? <laughs> just now, what just happened? Um. And uh, later, Augie shows he developed the picture and you could see it, but it was pretty, uh, that whole like scene was surreal, but it was even crazier how they had the alien kind of interact in a nonverbal manner, just with its eyeballs and its cues uh, right. off of that was, was pretty ingenious. Yeah, it was pretty creative.
Um, and I, I like the, uh, I like the, uh, the set for Asteroid City. Uh, it's just like this city. Uh, well, I say city. It's like a, you know, a, a one dog town essentially, right? Mm -hmm. So it's got a diner, the motel, the uh, astronomical uh, observatory. Um, and that's about, oh, and the gas station mm -hmm. and that's about it. And, um, but yeah, but it's, it's, uh, it's very well done. You know, 1950s is when it took, takes place. And, uh, you know, they got all these, uh, classic cars in there and, uh, the diner looks like a fifties diner and, um, and, uh, you have explosions being tested in the background. Right. <laughs> yeah. Nuclear bomb, Nuclear bomb testing. Yeah, and they're, they're they hear the the diner windows rattle in this big boom, and they run out. And Augie's got to get a picture of the mushroom cloud going up in the distance. There you got the is. gun shootout happening randomly <laughs> all the time. The cops and the cop on the bike chasing whoever it is in the in the car. Yeah, that's like a recurring thing. Every every so often, the cops go racing down the road chasing bad guys having a shootout in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> yeah, in the middle of nowhere, and there's a. Uh, right in the middle of town, there's like a on ramp to a highway. Oh, uh, but the on ramp, you go up, and the on ramp just ends, so it says indefinitely closed. Yeah, because it doesn't go anywhere. <laughs> yeah, which I guess maybe is uh, maybe that's a metaphor for the town. <laughs> no, nah. there's really going anywhere, right? Yeah. Well, the whole town is like so. The go back to what Charles was saying. You have to uh, go to sleep in order to wake up, or you have to wake up. You have to go to sleep. That theme that yeah. the actors and some of their um, brainstorming sessions with the director before he died, they had it. And one interpretation I read of that, and it does make sense to me. If this is a film about grief, is you have to let it go and just get involved with something else. You have to like, give yourself a break to heal from whatever you're grieving. You have to just get lost, be a part of something, do let yourself do something else so that when you come back, you're to that, to that grief, maybe it's a little bit better every time. See, and I, I saw that a little differently. I saw it as, um, you know, you, 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 uh, you can't wake up if you don't go to sleep. And I, I interpreted that as, you know, you can't move beyond grief if you don't let yourself experience it oh, right, and right. deal with it. That's kind of that's kind of mm -hmm. kind of how I saw that that message, but um, that's not you know because in be... a way like the town was them getting away from the real life and the grief sure. and everything to for a moment to be distracted and to find new ways to process that even if they don't realize they're processing it. Yeah, yeah, and, and I think that's why it's so ambiguous is because it leaves it up to open to uh, interpretation. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. It, it's it's what you take away from it. What it gets you thinking. We're talking about it now, right? Uh, right. How do we take that away in terms of how we process grief or don't process grief? Um, sure. You know, and I mentioned that earlier that Augie, for a good chunk of it, isn't processing any of it. Right. You know, and so, and he, though through the whole show, he's he he shows no emotion at all. Right. His entire all of his lines are very monologue, um, monotone um, delivery. Um, yeah, well, and, and there was a scene where he has this internal, the, the silent outburst, but but also physical at the same time when he's talking to Midge and he, he puts his hand onto the the, the quick burner and, oh, yeah. and burns oh, it, right. Yeah, you know, um, and, and that, you know, I, I don't know if that should be interpreted as him bottling it up and, and it's really what he feels inside all this pain, um, you know, as he's trying to we well, finally feel something. Yeah, he finally that's, feels yeah. something. That's yeah. what I was thinking. Yeah. When, when yeah. I realized this was about grief, I went, "That's they nailed it." I think for yeah. for the period of time, anyway. Because I know I've there's a you know back when or whatever, but but um, it seems to me that when, when something when someone close has died or that um, there is a period where you're just emotionally off, you can't get excited or angry. Yeah. And it, you know, the bombs could be going off and you're like, eh. <laughs> you know? yeah. Yeah. The same thing and with it, the movie actress. You go, eh. 
Yeah, that's, just, that's part of. I, I don't know what that is, but you're, you're, um, and then something happens. And yeah, it was like he was so separated from his ability to feel anything that he reached down to put his hand on there as a means of actually feeling something. I think is how I saw that. Mm -hmm. Well, and he Which was. He I was had completed Band of Brothers. <laughs> Again, watching that run through. So then coming in and then seeing this, like, oh, he's a war photographer. And I'm like, yep, that makes total sense. And not feeling everything after going through that. Right. Uh, he, uh, you know, there, there's all these various stages of, of grief. And I think uh, this film touches a lot of different stages and people may be at different stages of that grief. And I mean, he was so confused and lost at one point i mean he admits to his kids um or at least uh um woodrow woodrow and, and stanley at some point that he was considering I, I i couldn't tell how much he was lying or lying to himself on this but leaving them and he said yeah. well yeah. not for a long time but you know Just it was clear that he was maybe going to drop them off with stanley and then go figure things out for a time and it wasn't clear whether he was going to come back Right. Mm -hmm. Um. I mean, he says he did, but but that didn't sound confident either. Right. You know, it just sounded like, well, you're here, Woodrow, so I'll tell you. But just so you know, I was going to come back. It was, you know, I don't know yeah. when, but it wasn't going to be like forever. It, okay, so ten years, twenty years, like <laughs> right, right. What is, uh, what is a long time? Yeah. So he was in a tough spot <clears throat> in this film, but he does, uh, you know, like there's a there's a back and forth that that Augie has with his um, father-in-law, Stanley, which is, you know, he couldn't find the right time. To and, tell his and, kids about his wife's right, death. Tell his kids about the wife's death. And, and Stanley responds, Tom Hanks' character is, there is never a good time. Right. Like, that doesn't that doesn't exist. Like, it, it is what it is. Yeah. And um, it, it came up again later. Oh, my gosh. The scene just left my head. Um, where that same line comes up when they're talking about something else, and he says, "You know, there is no good time." And I can't remember if it was Stanley talking to someone else who said it or something of that nature, but uh, somebody else said it later on, and, and it kind of stuck out to me. And, and unfortunately, there's so much to kind of yeah. retain in that film; it just left me. But, um, you know, Midge also seems to be M Midge's character, Scarlett Johansson, uh, was interesting in this one because. <laughs> Uh, you couldn't ever, whenever they brought her into a scene, it was like, okay, is she reenacting something right now? Is she preparing <laughs> for another role? Or <laughs> is this her? Yeah. And and so that that also threw me a little bit. was like, how much of that was Midge and how much of that was, I, I'm fully investing myself into this character I'm going to portray, right? Right. Um, and so Scarlett Johansson's character, I felt completely a bit, um, miffed by who she really was because she was kind of mysterious in a way, kind of just like this 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 photo right here. Um, yeah. And she remains that way even through the end. Mm -hmm. You know, she kind of disappears, she says, no fanfare. She says she's not a good mom. She loves her daughter, but she's not a good mom. But she doesn't mm -hmm. feel guilty. She has an idea of what feel get guilt feels like from her character she's played. But if that's what it is, she's never felt it. Yeah. So, it's so is like she just you, dead inside, or like? Yeah, well, because the trauma of her childhood, it sounds like she, she is. Uh -huh. been her father, her uncles. Sounds like a couple of her husbands have beat her. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, to deal with all that, she just is a blank slate inside, other than this love for her daughter. And then, but the first priority is the film, these characters. So, do you think maybe? You know, the attraction that we see between Midge and, and Augie is maybe that they're similar in nature and how they deal with grief. Yeah. That's exactly what she said. She's like, we don't feel anything. We're dealing, we have these grief of situations, but we're not, we're not feeling them. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. My favorite scene with her, I think was the one where it, it opens up and you're, you're looking through the window of her bungalow from the perspective of Augie's bungalow. Mm -hmm. And you see her in a bathtub 
with her <laughs> arms hanging out and her head turned, her eyes, oh, you know, open, like she's everywhere. just committed suicide. Yeah, pills everywhere. Yeah. 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 And then, like, and, the first thing, I, go ahead, Bill. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's all just because she's practicing for a role. <laughs> yeah. She, she, Augie finds her and she's like, flip the page, or whatever like line whatever i'm you know i'm rehearsing this thing yeah well mick makes it really creep, uh, creepy for him is like she's the in a previous conversation she goes through this tirade that she doesn't feel anything and she's probably going to end up in the news or something yeah having taken too much pills and died right yeah and, and then her character just go through that and she's practicing the role and at first he's like the fuck yeah <laughs> Yeah, there was, I mean, there's a it, lot of little things to unpack with this. Yes. Like, I'm still trying to figure out the three daughters, which are hilarious. I know. And I think you mean the three little that. witches? Yes. No, no, no. They were a vampire, a witch, and a fairy. Ah, uh, yes, okay. And But the, the their grandpa called them the three little witches. Yes. <laughs> yes. A true because they have their... their three of them, I'm guessing they were triplets, are running around like doing their own thing, either doing spells, trying to bring their mom back from the dead because they have her ashes in Tupperware <laughs> or throwing rocks at a red runner mm-hmm, or playing right. with motor oil. Like they're, they're kind of always hovering this background full of life that their father is missing. Mm-hmm, right. Just a moment to engage them he can they're see kind of raising it. themselves, essentially. Mm-hmm. I don't know if they're raising themselves or just doing the thing that multiples do, which Chris as a multiple would know about, where they just kind of have their own world. And own language. Yeah, that is a thing. Mm-hmm. So, like, they're, mm-hmm. they're, they're processing their grief in their own way. But they're so full of life that Augie is just kind of like, I guess they're going to be okay. I'm just trying to figure things out and process these photos and uh, talk to this hot actress. <laughs> right. Well, uh, so we're about a uh, half hour in. Do we want to just go around and say uh, if you like the show and maybe what, what you like yeah. about it real quick. So let's uh, start with Charles. I- I liked it, but I, I think there should have been um, I hate <laughs> there should have been a warning because you go in thinking it's a sci-fi flick and right. it's, not, it's a movie about grief yeah. <laughs> and, and it's a sci-fi play. Yeah, if you weren't if you weren't in the right headspace, I I, I don't a bit of a rug pull. <laughs> I, I don't, which I don't think any of us were in the right heads. I don't think mm-hmm. anybody going into well, that would be in mean, the right though, headspace. If, if you're if you're actually stuff, I mean, maybe it's a good movie to watch, but I don't think it's a good movie to be surprised by if you were just returning from a funeral and trying to, you know, that's <laughs> fair. I, yeah. I, there should have been some sort of warning, I think. But right. Other than that, no, it was that uh, if you're. Into exploring grief, this is a good movie. Yeah. All right. Linda, let's jump to you. Um, I liked it. I don't, even if you take the grief part out of it, it's just kind of a weird rot frolic. You know, it's kind of a weird, yeah. weird but fun, uh, kind of a comedy sometimes. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. there were yes. parts where we were laughing our asses off. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I liked it. I thought it was good. All right. Jenna? I really liked it. Um, it doesn't have to make complete sense to me, but as a film in itself, the dialogue was fantastic. I don't think you see many films with that kind of clever dialogue that still feels so natural, and it's not all the same person. They all have their own personality, so yeah. that dialogue is coming out from the perspective versus everyone just being the same kind of clever, if that makes yeah. sense. No. And then sharing it that you as Chris described that it's a play that we're watching as this movie, but then there's these background about the the playwright versus what they did to get ready for the play. It was just a really interesting take that I hadn't seen before. And I really appreciated it for it. Nice. All right, Chris. Um, yeah, I liked it. And I, as Charles was saying, it, it feels like a bit of a rug pull, 
Uh, if you watch the trailers, I think the trailers were intended to sell it to get people to go see it. Because if you advertise it as a film on grief, you might yeah. not get a lot of people that, that show up to see it. And right. so the best thing you can do is kind of sell it as you have all these actors in here. It must be great. must be funny or yeah. whatever. And you know what? I think it is a, a, a great film. I think it is funny, um, even though it talks about um, grief. Um, but there's a lot to, to take away from it. I think it's a very smart film. And I think once you get, if you went into it with expectations, I would encourage you to watch it maybe twice, right? Knowing what it is and then having that different mindset going in to watch it the second time. So I, I actually want to watch it twice because um, there were distractions in there that, that I tried to put out of my mind. Like when we went back to talk about the playwriters and, and things like that, when it takes you out of the film, it's trying to immerse you in mm -hmm. uh, yeah. to these other scenes, it becomes a little bit distracting. Yeah. Uh, but I do think, you know, those set up different mind frames as you go from different acts and different scenes. Um, and that can be easily missed because you're like, wait, what just happened? Or, or what are we talking about? It, it gets you lost. Right. It kind of keeps you guessing. So um, that part I didn't like about the film, like I'd be interested to know, what a cut that took out the playwright stuff would look like without introducing mm -hmm. that, that, that fourth wall, if you will, um, mm -hmm. it, leaving the scene and taking you out of the film, uh, I think would have been maybe a better, even even better film um, without it. But I don't think that the overall message of grief uh, would have gotten home a bit right. and, and how the different characters were dealing with things um, or the actors that were playing them were dealing with things. So um, I liked it overall. If you liked films like uh, Little Miss Sunshine, which is like a top five for me, um, yeah. you know, that's a dysfunctional family that has a lot of issues that they're trying to deal with and things thrown at them, curveballs in life. Um, it ends up being a little bit funny, but, you know, life goes on and there's like a, a life lesson uh, to be made out of that movie. And this is kind of similar in that in that aspect. It's a serious film about serious problems, but they, they tend to tell it in the true way that we deal with things every day. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I'll give it an eight out of 10. It was, it was pretty good. Uh, some distractions in it, but I think it needs more than one watch through. Yeah. I think so too, especially because yeah. of that dialogue. There were so many little yeah. things uh, that was really well put together that you could either be distracted by the dialogue or distracted by the acting because it's so good and there's a lot of little things that they're doing going. Yeah. It was just like, it's like any of those other films where every time you watch it, you find these little Easter yeah. eggs or little tidbits or whatever. This is one of those from beginning to end. Everything is done with intent and purpose down to the scene, down to the actor, down to the, down to the color, down to the color, mm -hmm. palette, everything. So it, it's worth the repeat for that. At least one more. Yeah, I think I'll watch it uh, again because it'll be good now understanding that it's a movie about grief, looking at it from mm -hmm. that perspective. Um, I think that'll reveal some additional nuances in there that we probably missed the first time through. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I, I, I enjoyed it as well. So um, I'd encourage uh, encourage folks to check it out. Um, it, you know, it, it may sound like it's uh, depressing because it's on the on the subject of grief and how we deal with it, but uh, it's done very well. <clears throat> it's very hilarious. Uh, it's still, a lot of it's funny still, stuff in there. It's still lighthearted. Yeah, very lighthearted, and uh, the uh, the the actors are great in it, and they all play mm -hmm. such eccentric, bizarre characters that you're just kind of sitting there going, "What in the hell is happening?" So definitely, definitely worth watching. So. Agree. Yeah. If anything, right, well, I won't say what happened, but there's a Scarlett Johansson surprise in there too. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if you're fans of Under the Skin. You, oh God. <laughs> you'll you'll like it. All right. Sounds good. Well, thanks, folks, for tuning in. We will catch you next time. Until then, take care and have a great week. Bye bye. Later. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Galactic Driftwood Podcast. For more information and past episodes, please visit our website at galacticdriftwood.space or subscribe to us on YouTube. And now, please deactivate your cranial downlinks, collect your towels, and be sure to watch your step as you exit our gravity well.